so many people out on a Friday night. What did you say the over under was? 25. 25, okay. 24 right now. 20, okay, need one more then. And I, I appreciate you uh, spending a Friday evening like this with me. Can you hear me? Well, okay. Let me take a couple minutes to introduce myself to you. While I'm doing that, really I'm just doing it to fill time for you because I have a question for you. Actually, three questions. I want you to think about these three questions while I'm introducing myself. The first one is, what is your name? I find it easier to talk to people if I know the name. The second is, what drew you? Sorry. The, the second is, um, how many kids do you have in the school? Or, you know, something along that line. What is your connection to the school? And the third is, what drew you to Eagle Ridge Academy? What drew you to Eagle Ridge Academy? So think about those three questions. The first two probably will be easy. Um, I hope. But let me tell you why you're thinking about that, a little bit about myself. I got involved in classical education formally in 1993. I had a son who's 26 now, and he has two boys, so I'm a grandpa. Who wants to see a picture? <laughs> <laughs> and um, when, when my firstborn was about four or five years old, my wife and I were wrestling about how we're going to teach this guy. How are we going to bring him up to be the most perfect human specimen that ever lived? And uh, we found out that it was too late, and after all, I was the dad, so forget it. But we did, we did think real hard about what kind of education do we want to provide for him. And one of the things we came across was a book that some of you may have heard about. Have, have any of you heard of a book called Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning? Recovering the Lost Tools? Have you ever heard of an essay called The Lost Tools of Learning? This Lost Tools of Learning concept was really important in the 90s. It started a whole wave of classical schools, especially in the private school network. Uh, well, I guess it's not formally a network, but especially among private schools. Hundreds of private schools um, came into to being because of this notion of, the, the re of recovering the lost tools of learning. The term tools of learning is one I've been thinking about constantly now for 20 years. Dorothy Sayers, who was one of uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien's friends, they used to sit around at the the eagle and child and read their books to each other and argue and stuff. She was the first woman ever to get a PhD from Oxford. And she's the one who wrote um, recovering, or she wrote the essay called The Lost Tools of Learning. And in it she argued that, and this is in the 1940s when she wrote this essay, in it she argued that something had happened to education in the previous 40 or 50 or 60 years. And that was that the tools of learning that had been taught students in schools from the ancient world had just been abandoned. That, that suddenly we, we weren't teaching kids how to think anymore. And she said, whatever else is true, if we're not teaching children how to think, we're not educating them. If a child can graduate from 12th grade in England, you know, from, a, from a, what did they call it over there, A, a levels or whatever, if a, if a child can go through all of this and still not think for himself, still not think for herself, then he's not educated, she's not educated. And so she, she wrote this essay in response to that, and here's her premise. There are tools of learning. Anybody can learn them. In fact, for 2,500 years, that's what it meant to be educated, was to learn these tools of learning. And now, for some reason, we've stopped. Well, we haven't taught them a whole lot more since Dorothy Sears wrote in the 40s. In fact, I would argue we've taught them less since she wrote that essay in the 40s. But in the 80s, a gentleman named Douglas Wilson had the same question I had. How am I going to educate my kid? He had a daughter named Rebecca. She was five years old. He and his wife were talking. What are we going to do? And they read the Dorothy Sayers essay in which she said, now I know I'm not an educational expert, so nobody's going to do anything with this. And Doug Wilson said, I agree with everything in this essay except that. I'm going to start a school. And that school was opened in 1981, the same year that one of the most important books on education was written. It's called Norms and Nobility. I'll throw that out for your consideration. If you want to read a really, really hard book, but the best book on education written since the 1940s, get Norms and Nobility by David Hicks, 1981. Um, and the other really important educational thing that happened that year was I graduated from high school. <laughs> which probably shouldn't have happened. But anyway, so, so, so Dorothy Sayers writes this essay, Douglas Wilson starts a school, and 12 years later, 10 years later, that school had grown, it was in Moscow, Idaho of all places. 
that school had grown and, and had been, people were coming from all over the country to put their kids in the school. And so a publishing company asked him to write a book about it. And he wrote the book, Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning, which had the essay, The Lost Tools of Learning, as an appendix. That's what I read in 1993. A lot of people I found out since then had the same experience that I did. They got to the end of the book and they said, I have to start a school. In my case, it was kind of a funny idea. I was 29 years old, didn't have a college degree, and started a school. Imagine getting away with that now. <laughs> but my board, the board of the school that I helped start, it was in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's called Providence Academy. The board of that school felt it was important that I get a college degree. So I went to a school called Concordia University down in Milwaukee and graduated in 1996. So because I was in the adult accelerated curriculum, I was able to get my college degree in only 15 years. <laughs> but we did have a school. And that school, I'm pleased to say, 20 years later is still going. It hasn't grown like gangbusters. It hasn't become a multi-hundred student school. Uh, there's about 115, 120 kids, I think, in that school now. But they're still going. And hopefully they're, they're, keeping, they're keeping the classical vision. The thing I want to emphasize in all this, though, is how important it was to me. Because I, I, I was, I guess you call it selfish when you do something for your own children. I don't know why that would be considered selfish. But anyway, I was thinking about my children. And I wanted my children to get the get best education they could possibly get. And this concept of tools of learning... This sang to me. This, this leapt off the page to me. There are tools. There are actually tools. And if you master those tools, you can think well. You can learn new things. And for 20 years now, I've been studying. What are those tools? Where did they come from? The concept of tools of learning goes back, I, I have no idea when it started, but the most famous early ex expedition, explanation of it was by a man you probably have heard of, named Aristotle. Anybody ever hear Aristotle? Uh, the master of those who know, is what Dante called him. Nobody has taught the human race how to think more than Aristotle. Nobody has had more of an impact on the way we live today in terms of practical daily life than Aristotle. Science, as we know it today, is a direct result of Aristotle's inquiries. He, his dad was a doctor. So he studied everything as though it was biology. He studied everything by, you know, you collect samples and you compare them with each other and you learn. He studied constitutions that way. He collected constitutions. You probably know he sent Alexander the Great. Well, he sent Alexander the Great. He told Alexander the Great, he trained him when he was a kid, at least for a couple of years. Sorry, let me clarify my pronouns. Aristotle trained Alexander the Great, taught him when he was a child. When Alexander the Great went out on his expedition to conquer the world, Aristotle asked him to send samples back. And so he built up this huge biological collection of, of fauna and, and ferns and animals and everything from all over the world. Nobody had ever done anything like this before that. Nobody had ever had the chance to do it before that. He collected plants. He collected animals. He collected constitutions. He collected philosophies. He collected ideas. And he compared them all with each other. And in so doing, he basically was studying how do people study everything? How can we learn everything there is to know? And of course, it didn't take long for him to figure out that you can't learn everything there is to know. But he did learn that there are kinds of things that we can know. That there are, that there are different, what they would have called science, well, he, would, he spoke Greek, but when they made it Latin, they would have called it sciences. Okay. Um, a science in the, in the Latin or the Greek mind is a, is a way of knowing something. It's Latin scientia means knowledge. Now, in the 17th century, in the 18th century, they decided that the only things we actually can know are things that can be scientifically proven. Aristotle would have laughed at that. In fact, in the 19th and 20th century, people did start laughing at that. But for about 150 years, Western Europeans at least, were thinking, unless you can prove it scientifically, it's not true. Our, our schools still tend to operate that way. But Aristotle identified different kinds of knowledge. But more to the point here, he identified the tools that we need to master to get these different kinds of knowledge. Let's say, for example, you're going to be a, a car mechanic. 
Okay, there's, there's certain kinds of knowledge you need to be a car mechanic. I think you'd agree with me if I argued that that kind of knowledge is different from the kind of knowledge a doctor uses to cure a disease. But not totally. Not totally. There are some similarities. There are some common patterns to it. And here's what's really interesting. No matter what subject you're studying, no matter how the, the object that you're studying differs from some other study. So for example, like I said, a car mechanic versus a doctor, a biologist versus a chemist, a philosopher versus a poet. All of them are learning different subjects. All of them are learning different things outside of their mind. But in their mind, the process that the mind goes through is exactly the same. And by identifying that, Aristotle made it relatively easy, relatively easy to teach. And he wrote a series of handbooks. And this series of handbooks is called the Organon. Has anybody ever had to read Aristotle's Organon? Until about 1800, that was what you did for your basic education. You read the Organon and things like it. The Organon was changed a bit. And here's, here's, here's why it's called the organon. You probably can see the word organ in there, right? It's an instrument or a tool. And Aristotle is using the term for the first time that I'm aware of in a, in a very systematic way, is using the term tool of learning. And what he's arguing is that there's an art to learning, there are, there, there's a craft even, you could say, of learning, and there are certain tools that if you get really good at using them, you can learn anything. And you can compare what you know in various, and you don't even have to be an expert to evaluate what an expert says. You can critique what somebody says, even in a domain that you don't know, because you know how to think. Okay? And you could say that that organon, that box of tools, you could reduce it to a simple term, logic. Now, Logic used to be a really big deal in schools. Do you know that they, they hardly teach it anymore? They might have a specialized logic class. This would be Wilder Aristotle. Wait a minute, so you're taking all of learning and you're making it a, or you're taking the foundation of all of learning and you're making it one class. What's all the other stuff based on? In other words, it's as if all of the other things we study are illogical and then there's this one subject, a specialized subject, called logic. And Aristotle, I think, would have pulled his hair out of his head. He would have said, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't think without this. Make this what you teach. Use the other things to teach this. But make this what you teach. Because there was an organon, there was a set of tools, an art of learning, everybody who was educated was learning the art of learning. And then came what we call the Enlightenment for some reason. Oh yeah, because they named it themselves. There was this period of time when, when the Western Europeans were poking their eyes out and telling everybody, this is how you see. And during that time, things like Aristotle's logic, his organon, were set aside. They were minimized, they were reduced. They were specialized, you could even say. And you started to study everything as though it was biology. And you look, at, you look at it in the 20th century, you see, and it's still done somewhat now. Well, it's still done this way, yeah. But if you study literature in a college, right, you typically study literature the same way you study biology. If you study history, you study it the same way you study physics. Now, obviously, there are differences, otherwise you wouldn't have two subjects. But all of these, these less precise subjects are studied as though they were very precise subjects. And now they have, since that doesn't work, when I was in college in my history class, we had a textbook called What is History? And the author's conclusion was, and he was one of the world leading experts on history, his conclusion was, we really don't know what history is. There, there's, nah, there isn't really any such thing as history. It's just a name we attach to a certain kind of activity for fun. But there's no actual study of history. And that's an awful lot of subjects. He, that author would have been cured if he'd done a close read of Aristotle. He had to learn the tools of learning. And so many of the experts in our culture never learn the tools of learning, and yet they become expert in a given area. The most fun thing, the most fun thing is when they start talking about philosophy. 
never having learned logic. Or having learned logic at it. Or, or studying philosophy as though philosophy is physics. Right? Which is what Immanuel Kant did. This is why I, one of my favorite bumper stickers, have you ever seen this? Genghis Khan, but Immanuel Kant. <laughs> There's actually meaning to that. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sorry. So, so this, I'm beating this horse to death, aren't I? The point is that there are these tools that every single human being can learn, and not only that, every single human being needs to learn if they're going to become good at learning. It's like playing an instrument. You, know, you, can't, you can't become good at music if you never learn to play anything. But we think we can become good at thinking without ever practicing. We just follow our feelings, or worse, follow our heart, whatever that is. Well, there's one other point I want to make about this, and then I'm going to get your names. Oh, yeah, for those of you who, who have come in since I asked for this, I'm going, to, I'm going to go around and get three pieces of information from each of you. Your name, um, your connection to the school, in other words, if you have three kids in the school, what grades they're in, something like that, and then what drew you to Eagle Ridge Academy. Okay, name, relationship to the school, and what drew you to the academy. I think you got your 25 there, Jason. Um, Another statement from Aristotle. In the beginning of his book, The Metaphysics, he said, all people, by nature, desire to know. All people, by nature, desire to know. And then when he proves his point, he makes a really interesting, fascinating description of, uh, he gives a really fascinating piece of evidence. And boy, basically, it boils down to this. That's why we keep our eyes open. There are practical benefits to keeping your eyes open. Would you agree with that? Definitely there are practical benefits. But that's not always why you keep them open. It's not only to survive and conquer. Sometimes you keep your eyes open because the world is really cool. Right? It's really interesting looking around. Well, what does that mean? It means you want to know. The delight that we take in our senses is what he calls it. It's not just the practical benefits we get from using our senses. But the delight that we take in our senses, what is that delight? It's knowledge. And I think what happens so often is we go to school. See, every five-year-old loves learning. Most of them are cured by the time they're seven. <laughs> but actually, they're not. They're not cured of the love of learning. They're confused about what learning is. They've come to think that only what happens at school is actually learning. Whereas, in fact, in many cases, what happens at school is not learning. It's drawing all sorts of practical applications or learning to adapt to the environment, but it's not perceiving truth. And what Aristotle is arguing, in, and notice the phrasing again, all people, by nature, desire to know. Now, would you agree if I said that by nature we desire to eat? Right? Okay. Nature demands it of us. If we don't eat, how many of you are really happy if you can go a year or two without eating? <laughs> we don't survive. Right? Because it's by nature. There's no escaping it. Aristotle is saying the same thing is true of knowing. If we don't come to know, we become very, very unhappy. It may even be that while our body keeps on living, something about us dies. Something about us might even die. And I'm arguing, this is my feisty moment, I'm arguing that in American education today, because we have displaced the lost tool, because we have lost the tools of learning, because we no longer cultivate the capacity for wisdom and knowledge in children, so many of them, so many American children, something inside them has died by the time they're 8, 9, 10 years old. They're in despair. They don't believe that they can find the truth. Why? Did some teacher say, you know, you'll never find the truth? It's not knowable. Probably not. There are some teachers who are cruel like that. Not very many, though. But the way we teach them, they become convinced that there is no knowable truth. For example, we take the, we take the curriculum and we make it totally fragmented. Right? So you walk into one class. We probably, probably 90 or more percent of you have gone through this. I certainly did. You go into one class. You sit there for 50 minutes and hear the teacher talk about something, the bell rings, you leave all that behind, you 
fill a thimble and then pour it out as you walk out. Then you walk into the next class five minutes later, somewhere down the hall, somewhere else, and pick your books up off the floor with somebody knocks them on your hands. You get to the next class, and you sit there for 50 minutes, and what you learn in that second class is nothing whatsoever to do with what you learned in the first class. Then you go on to a third class, no connection. Middle school and high school, you got seven or eight hours of classes, and there's, you, you are never told that there's a connection. You are never shown a connection between them. Because every class is a class. It's a thing considered in itself, and what's your goal? Pass the test. It's, it's not to gain knowledge and assemble. Think of it this way. It's, to, it's, it's not to assemble the puzzle of learning. That is life. That is what the mind so wants to see. And so what happens is by the time you're in 8th or ninth grade, you've come to the conclusion that there is no relation between these subjects. That's despair. Do you know how unhappy the mind is to discover that? Now, I can't prove this, and so this is going to sound sort of melodramatic, but I really believe that the reason there's a, that one out of every 12 teenagers tries to commit suicide and an awfully high percentage of kids is, is cutting, cutting themselves and doing all sorts of cruel things to themselves is because they're in despair. And if it's by nature that we want to know, and we're not letting our kids know, in fact, we're putting up barriers between them and knowledge, then we're defying their very nature. And if your nature is unsatisfied, you cannot be happy. Does that make sense to you? You cannot be happy if you can't have what you want. More than, by nature. In other words, we can want what we want because we're conditioned or whatever, but there are certain things that you can't not, not, you can't not want. And according to Aristotle, knowledge is one of them. And so if you go through life never gaining knowledge, you can't be happy. Now some of you are going, that's absurd, we don't all want knowledge. Some people are practical. Yeah, I agree. And not everybody wants the same kind of knowledge. But there's a kind of knowledge that everybody wants. There, I mean, and let me rephrase that so I say it more correctly. Everybody wants some kind of knowledge. Everybody wants to know some things. And yes, it is personality affects it, our, our dispositions and experiences affect it, but all of us want knowledge in some area. Sometimes it's because it does have practical benefits. But ultimately, all of us want some kind of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, you, you meet these kids that, that in school, they, they just come across like they're complete morons, and then get them talking about basketball, get them talking about football, get them talking about cars. They're geniuses. But you never find that out in school. Well, whose fault is that? The, the mind is so hungry, and then we starve it, and the, and the soul becomes famished. But if what Aristotle said is true, that all men by nature desire to know, then one of our most important functions as parents and as teachers is to equip them to satisfy that desire. I, I quoted something to the teachers today, so if you were there for this this afternoon, forgive me, but one of my absolute favorite lines in all of poetry is in Dante's Paradiso, and he says this, Much worse than uselessly, he leaves the shore, more full of error than he was before, who fishes for the truth, but lacks the art. I'm going to say that again, but I want to give you some context for it. Dante, when he wrote that poem, was in exile. He lived in Florence, but he'd been exiled by the Florentines because of some political mess he'd got involved in. And about, he was exiled for 35 years. That's why if you go to Florence today, you can find the Dante's tomb. It's, it's the American joke, right? Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Anybody know? Does anybody know who's buried in Grant's tomb? It's Grant. But if you go to Italy and you say, who's buried in Dante's tomb? Nobody. Because the Ravenna, the city of Ravenna, they've got his body, and 700 years later, they still won't give it back because they're saying to the Florentines, while he was alive, he didn't want him. What are you doing now? So Dante is in exile. And he's in the city of Ravenna, which is a port city. And I always imagine this when I think of those lines. Dante is a poet, so he sits around doing nothing, right? That's what, that's what poets do. <laughs> Observing life. Well, he does this. He goes down to, he goes down to the port. 4.30 in the morning. Eastern Italy. Can you see it? 
Everything is beautiful in Italy. The water is beautiful. The mist is beautiful. The beat up, rugged fishing boats are all beautiful. And and there's and he's sitting there, I don't know, on a on a on a cliff maybe or whatever, but he's looking over the port, and all these ki- all these fishermen come down to the port and they get in their boats. They get their tackle ready, they get ready to go fishing, and they spend probably a couple hours, I'm gonna guess, getting everything ready to go out. And then they go out on the sea. Now, does anybody know what sea the the the, uh, uh, the city of Ravenna is on? Pardon? Did, did you say Mediterranean? Yeah. It is. It's a, it's an offshoot of the Mediterranean, right? I believe it's the Illyrian Sea there, but it's still it's part of the Mediterranean. Now, does any has anybody ever boated on the Mediterranean? I'm going to give you a clue. You have in Israel, in Israel. okay? And did you happen to catch any weather while you were out? Yeah, and did the wind make any waves? I don't recall. Okay, well, all right. And maybe, maybe, maybe that far from all the islands, it's even calmer. But I can tell you that if you're in the Adriatic Sea, if you're, if you're in that area around Italy and around Greece, okay, the Mediterranean can be very calm and very beautiful and very friendly. But read some of these old, these old myths, like the, the Odyssey or, or the Aeneid. Or, or, the, uh, or read the book of Acts, and read, read some of these, um, Paul, I mean, uh, Julius Caesar, his adventures, and Pompey driving out the pirates. One thing you can know about the Mediterranean Sea is, it's not predictable. Okay. So, Dante watches as these people get into their boats, they get everything all ready, and they go out on the sea to go fishing. Now, in my imagination, and I confess this is all speculative, it's just me fabricating something, but in my imagination, I see Dante watching this, these people come down to the sea, get ready to go fishing. And then, for whatever reason, a young man comes out. Maybe he's 15 or 16 years old, because in those days at 15 or 16, if you couldn't run a household, there was something wrong with you. So this 15, 16-year-old kid, he comes down, and, and, and he jumps in a boat. But he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't, he's, it's clear to Dante that this guy, he's filling in for somebody. Maybe his dad is sick that day, so he's got to take the boat. So he throws the tackle in in a hurry, and he gets his boat ready, but he's not really ready, and it's not set. And then he goes out on the sea. Now, I imagine Dante then, having seen this guy go out, wondering, how is he going to come back? What's it going to be like when he comes back? Maybe there's a storm that day out on the Adriatic or out on the Mediterranean. Maybe all the other boats start coming in around sunset. And again, it's very beautiful. Very relaxing, calming time for everybody but Dante who's watching. He's, where's that kid? Maybe he comes kind of dragging in last with nets dragging behind and everything's a mess. Or maybe while he was out on the sea, a storm happened, and he didn't know what to do. Maybe he went down. Or maybe somebody rescued him. But in any case, at the end of the day, either he comes home or he doesn't. But he's not successful. And Dante thinks to himself, man, that was worse than useless. That was downright dangerous. That was downright harmful. He might have lost his life. Okay, now transfer that over to fishing for the truth. That's fishing for fish on the sea. But what if you're fishing for the truth? Now remember, Aristotle says, everybody is by nature always doing that. When you wake up in the morning, you want to know the truth? How many of you like being lied to? You wake up in the morning, you want to know the truth? You spend all day, there's a part of you, all day long, unless you've given up on it, all day long there's a part of you that's looking for the truth. And what Dante is saying is, if you're like that kid, and you've never been trained, you've never practiced, you've never never learned the art of fishing for the truth, and you're out on the sea fishing for the truth, it's worse than useless. You can destroy yourself, you can destroy your community, you can destroy your family, you can destroy a business, you can destroy... I mean, what happens when stupid ideas get put into politics? That would never happen in America. (laughs) 
Do, who pays for it? Who pays for it when folly is put into practice? Depends on the degree of the folly, doesn't it? But do you see how, do you see how what Dante is getting at is that it is worse than useless to go fishing for the truth, to go out and try to find the truth but not know how to find it. And what Aristotle presents to us and what the classical tradition presents to us is tools. Tools by which we can go out and find the truth. We can go out fishing. Now, not every time you go fishing are you successful. You know, it's an art, not a science. Fishing is. So every time you go out, you know, if you've mastered the tools, it doesn't mean that you're going to be the most successful, you know, perfectly successful fisherman every time. Truth is still hard to get. But if it's hard to get when you're trained to get it, how much worse when you're not trained at all, but still hungry for it? And I think that's what concerns me the most, is that you, you, you can talk to a, fi a fifth grade kid in our culture, get in a discussion about something, and typically by fifth grade, may, but certainly by seventh or eighth grade, if you get into a discussion, the typical American reaction is one of two things. Well, that's true for you. Right? You ever hear that? That's true for you. What does that mean? Yeah, that means there is no truth. That means I've fallen into despair. Makes me want to cry when I hear somebody say that. Or they'll say, ah, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> Can't we all just get along? Well, look, there are times when you have to admit that truth is hard. And you have to say, okay, look, we're going to have to just put this on hold for now. We can't settle this issue now. There are things that have been argued about for thousands of years. It would be a little bit obtuse for a 16-year-old in high school to say, I got it. <laughs> That's, by the way, one of the tools that you need to find the truth. Patience. Patience is time. Right? There's character tools as much as intellectual tools. You might say there's virtues. All right, so, so Aristotle is arguing that everybody wants to know the truth. And then he says, and here are tools by which we can get it if we master these tools. There's one last point I want to make, and then I'm going to start calling on you. The last point I want to make is that everything follows the quest for truth. Everything follows the quest for truth. Let me explain what I mean by that. In our culture, because we don't actually believe in truth anymore, not formally, not in, not in our public lives, we're not allowed to believe that something is true, we're only allowed to believe that something is to our advantage. Okay. If, 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 we, if we're going to assess education in America, one thing we, we can't do is assess whether the student is good at perceiving truth. That would imply, that would be, I guess, in some sense, non-pluralistic or something, I don't know. I've never been able to get my head around why that is. But, but we, can't, we can't assess whether a child perceives truth. So what's left? We can assess whether they got good at something, whether they developed a skill, or we can assess how much information they can remember. Now here's the deep irony. When it comes to skills of thinking, and when it comes to facts that you remember, those are interesting and exciting to a kid if they can be learned, used to find truth. But if they're supposed to learn skills and, and um, information so that they can pass tests, they feel, and rightfully, manipulated. They feel this isn't really worth all this work. I'll do it, some will say, because I'm obedient. Or, yeah, I want to get into a good college, I want to get rich. They'll do it for that reason. And then it'll be like a friend of mine, um, Tony Jarvis was the uh, headmaster at Roxbury Latin School, which is one of those super elite schools founded in 1645. Interesting. He was the headmaster from the beginning. I met him. Just, just <laughs> Tony Jarvis what, um, was the headmaster at Roxbury Latin. One day on a Saturday night, it's about 11 o'clock, he gets off the, um, the, the train in Boston. What is that called? Anybody know what that train's called in Boston? 
like in Chicago, there's the L train, you know, I forget what it's called, the Boston. Anyway, he gets, he gets off the train, and as he's stepping off, he sees a former student. This guy's about 30 years old now. He says hello, and they have this conversation. All he says to the guy is, how are you doing? And the guy kind of drops his eyes and he says, you know, Tony, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Tony says, why? What's, what's going on? He says, well, you know, I went to Roxbury Latin and I graduated first in my class. When I got out of Roxbury Latin, I went to Harvard. Graduated first in my class. Then I went to Harvard Law. Graduated, I think he said second in my class. First or second in my class. That's pretty good at Harvard Law. Second. Passable. Oliver Barrett only came third. That was a 1969 reference, forgive me. I graduated second in my, in, in my class at law school. Now I'm working at the top law firm in Boston. Working about 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week. Prospering, doing well. But you know what, Tony? I have no idea why I'm doing this. Can you imagine pouring yourself out like that? Like a libation on the ground? From the time you're a kid till the time you're 30? And then having to look yourself in the mirror and say, why are you doing this? Isn't that one of the first questions we should help a kid answer? Why am I doing this? See, if we put truth first, everything follows. And everything gets put in the right place. But if we put great scores on a test first, we might well be sacrificing the truth. If we put riches first, we might well be sacrificing our own souls, our minds, our well-being, our own happiness. And we might wake up 30 years old, 40 years old, sometimes 70 years old, having consumed our lives we might look in the mirror then and say, I have no idea why I did this. I think we owe it to our kids to help them understand why. And I think the test scores will take care of themselves then. If we put truth first, everything follows. Now, if you're hearing, whenever, whenever I hear the word truth, if you're hearing big mystical concepts, you know, religious stuff or philosophical stuff, there is that. Okay. But basically, if you learn the distributive property in math, that's a truth. Okay. 3 plus 2 is 5. That's the truth. Okay. It's the truth. Any truth. Any truth gives you access to more truth. Any truth helps you to think clearly. Any truth orders your mind. How many of you like having a chaotic, confused mind? When you, when you have these moments of clarity, do you just try really hard to get out of them? Back into confusion. Do you see? Do you see? That's 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 funny because that's what Aristotle's talking. About. Of course, we don't like confusion. Why? Because by nature we desire to know. Do you see? By nature we want to know the truth. We don't like confusion. Last illustration I'll use. How many of you have ever wept over any class in school? Raise your hand if you ever wept over over a class in school. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what class it was that you wept over. <laughs> It was math. Right? I wept one time in school. This is the most embarrassing thing in the world. I was in 12th grade. I wept over trigonometry class. Because I couldn't do it. I hadn't done algebra 2. When my math teacher said to me, Andrew, what are you doing in this class? I was so ashamed. I in the library. I wept. Very embarrassing moment. Low point in my life. Now, there are other classes people can weep over. You know, it might be... It might be from reading Jane Eyre or something. But generally speaking, the class, this amazes me, the class that people exert and spend the most energy on, the most emotional energy, the most stressful class, is math. And I've been thinking, why is that? These kids say they don't want to learn math anyway. They say they don't care. Well, why are they crying? <laughs> you know why? Because we hate not knowing. And when you're in literature class, 
You can fudge it, right? You can pretend you gained an insight here. You can even grab something and write flourishing paragraphs, pages on end, and pretend that you saw something. But in math, if you don't see the distributed property, you don't see it, and you can't deny it. And it puts your ignorance right in front of you, and we hate, hate not knowing. By nature, we want to know. Now here's the point and the good news in all this. We have a 2,500 year tradition in which the tools of learning have been refined and perfected to an incredible degree. And if we have the courage to order our, our teaching and our instruction toward knowing the truth, toward seeing truth, and I'll add the good and the beautiful, toward seeing the true, the good, and the beautiful, which is what our souls feed on, if we have the courage to order our instruction toward the true, the good, and the beautiful, we have the tools already developed for us by this tradition. And they work. And you can see very rapidly changes in kids' attitudes. Now, one of the most bizarre things I've seen, I've seen marriages saved by, by this. I kid you not, there was a kid in my class when I taught third and fourth grade, there was a kid in my class who got excited about astronomy. I mean, I love astronomy, but my goodness, you know what I was using to teach astronomy? These were the days of the overhead projector. <laughs> Had an overhead projector with a slide on it of the constellations. You know, little squares and stuff showing. This is, and I would, and I would, I had them memorize in a cyclical pattern all the constellations. Well, one of these kids was a Girl Scout. And a couple months later, she's out on a Girl Scout trip, and she, she goes out in the middle of the night, and, and this is in Idaho where you can still see the sky, and she, she takes, she's out with her friends, and she starts pointing out all these constellations. Well, the kids were in awe. They were young enough that they still were impressed, right? <laughs> so, there, so, so she's showing them all these constellations. It gets home, and her parents hear about this, and they're seeing their daughter come to life because she's learning things. Nope. Is there any practical benefit in the modern world to knowing the stars? Yeah, there is, but you know who sees it, right? You, there, we can make practical use, but we've got our iPhones with compasses now. Who needs it, right? <laughs> we, don't, we don't need it to. We don't need it to steer ships and stuff. But it's beautiful, for goodness' sake! It's amazing. And she was out there. Trivial information, we might even call it got home to the parents that she was showing the other kids all the constellations and they said there's something going on at that school and they told me later on that in their marriage they were struggling and because of what was going on at that school and because their daughter was showing constellations their marriage they, they resolved to rebuild their marriage that to me is amazing just weird things happen when, when truths are discovered weird things happen that might sound way off the the margin, but that's kind of my point, is really weird things happen. All right, so that's that's my five-minute introduction. <laughs> you all are doing really well. <laughs> we might end up going till 10. No, I'm just kidding. No. We won't do that. <laughs> I have to fly home too early in the morning. I'm going to be selfish about it. But um, I'd like to hear from you, and because there's, there's a decent number of you, again, Jason, you're past 25, so you win. Um, I'd like to hear from you, and this is what I want to know from you, is and, and in about 10 minutes we'll take a break, but tell me what your name is, tell me about your relation to the school, and tell me what drew you to Eagle Ridge Academy. I'm going to give you 15 seconds max, otherwise it'll take the whole night, so be as concise as you possibly can. Can we start with you? Sure, everyone, I can speak for both of us. Okay. Matt and Stacy Steen, um, we have a daughter in ninth grade, just started here, Brielle Steen. And uh, we just wanted a school with a uh, challenge. She did too. Challenge. All right. Good. Thank you. Matt and Stacy. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Kelly and Martha Duclos, uh, daughter in third grade. And I'd say it was class size. Oh, okay. From class where, size. Where we live, the alternatives are, you know, massive. Massive. Schools. And my well, massive so. grades, too. I got to tell you, I sat in a, a class with 32 kids back in the corner banging my head on the wall for fun when I was in eighth grade. I don't know what the big deal was about class size. I could hide really well. <laughs> Kelly and Martha. All right, thank you. And back to you. Is that you? So, uh, my daughter is in second grade. Great. And basically, 
just uh, one is the, the school as uniform here. Okay. And the second is the discipline. The discipline. Excellent. How do you say your name, Sanjit? Sanjit Nambiar. Was I anywhere close? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, over to you. Uh, I'm Ridiman, her name is Sayoni, and my son is in uh, kindergarten, he just joined this year. Wow. So the reason we wanted to come to the school was more because of the classical education, because I grew up with that background, so I wanted him to be also uh, right. growing up with that background as well. Plus the discipline is much better than any public school. Right. So, All right. So Your first name? Uh, Ridiman, it's a little complicated, Ridiman. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll go back. <laughs> is it Ru Rudeman? Close. Close. Close, okay, thank you. <laughs> Very forgiving, I appreciate yeah. that. Um, my name is Steve Hunt. I have a second grade boy. Um, I met someone at a park and she said, uh, you're getting a private school education for free, basically. Wow. <laughs> and we came and visited. And that's, but, but really, I, I really believe in the, the liberal arts and mm -hmm. um, I'm an educator myself. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Liberal arts is actually the, the term that was developed in the Middle Ages to describe Aristotle's Organic, mm -hmm. the tools of learning. Trouble is, in the modern college, they use liberal arts for something altogether different. So thank you, Steve. And you're next. I am. Okay. All the husbands have spoken. Oh, <laughs> Stephanie and Jay Jowell. Uh, our son is our third child, the youngest. We, we moved in here. We wanted a change from the public school and challenge and challenge. exercises. I am an educator as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's an eighth grader. Eighth grader. All right, good. So you educators, how much have I offended you so far? Uh, okay, I just you're... was in a training all day, so it was kind of cool. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that, but I'll take it as positive. Thank you. All right, behind in the in the. Hi, I'm Halavi, and this is my husband Anu. I have two kids here, and um, I love to school because of the traditional teaching, and right. because I was brought up that way. So right. I love the uniform and the way. You do. All right, good. The traditional teaching and the uniform. Good. Thank you. And over to the end. My son is in third grade. Third grade. So we just moved uh, this year to the school. So we like the traditional uh, education and also the discipline and challenging. All right, good. We'll keep the pressure on. Make it keep. Make them keep it challenging. All right, good. Dan, did you want to comment? <laughs> uh, my name is Dan Trev. Well, actually, uh, I'm a teacher here. <laughs> And what drew me here was about 10 years of pursuing understanding what classical education was. I used to teach something else. So this is my 21st year of teaching, and three of them have been here. They've been very good. Good. Thank you. And then Michelle. Melon. Melon. I keep going back and forth, don't I? Sorry. I'm Melanie Bear. I'm the local principal. And what drew me here, it was a long journey, but you say as a private school, I was a private school teacher for a long time. and figured that what I was doing in my classroom, because I had autonomy there, was actually classical, so I started looking at classical schools, which mm -hmm. the, therefore drew me to England. All right, good. We'll come over here. Uh, we're David and Nina Harbath. We have four boys, 12th grade, 9th grade, 7th grade, and 1st. And um, we don't have any of the Eagle Ridge, we're just looking at different options. Have I talked you out of Eagle Ridge? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. And over here. My name is Sarah, and I have two kids, ninth grade, sixth grade, and second grade. And uh, I like the challenge. The challenge. challenge. Everything. All right, everything. Good. I'm from Alberta uh, uh, College. When you say Concordia and New Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, nice to meet you. Let's go over here. I'm Gary Evely. Um, I have one daughter who's here, and she's in ninth grade. And for us, it was the curriculum. We've always been. Um, and cooked up with core knowledge and Saxon mm -hmm. math and, mm -hmm. and the curriculum. All right, so it blended well. Yes. Good. Gary. Gary. And then to your right. Yeah, I'm Bethany. Um, I graduated two years ago from here, and um, I basically came here in sixth grade to avoid public schools. <laughs> <laughs> did it work? Yes, it did. All right. Thank you. Karen Jordan. I have a kindergartner here, and we were drawn here. We have an eighth graders in another school. We were drawn here for the homework. Um, um, you know, the challenge, the love of learning, and the discipline, and just, and we're, we've been happy. So far, our guy's eating up everything. Good. And surprising the eighth grader with what he knows. Mm -hmm. All right. The kindergartner, they actually have little debates. I mean, he's kindergarten, the other's eighth yeah, grader, yeah. and they've got their little debates going. 
Wait a minute, kindergartners can debate? Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right, good. Thank you. Let's go to the back, Dan. I'm Dan Walker, teacher fifth grade here, and wrong somewhat the same time this guy was the other Dan. And I think is, I think I'm a natural classical teacher, and I kind of have a love for learning and want to impart that to kids. All right. Good. Yes. I'm Kirsten Walker. I teach elementary Latin. Um, I started here well, probably initially with the <laughs> <laughs> But I too, I mean, the classical education is just as naturally who I am and how I teach. And so it's been fun to do that. And I love that they teach the whole child, not just the mind, but the heart and the spirit. And, you know, the personal, the pillars are just huge. All right. Good. Thank you. Let's come here. Uh, I'm Arun Singh, and I have a son who is in kindergarten. We basically did a survey among many parents and found out this is probably the best school for him. Good. So that's how we chose this school. Good. And, and that's the first your first job in kindergarten? Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Maybe a year from now I'll hear more. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you. And April? Um, April Grubansky. I have a first grader and a second grader here, and I teach fifth grade um, here. And I'm also on the board. And the wow, reason, so you've got yeah, I'm three arms. arms. I'm always here. I should have put a bed in my but uh, I was drawn to this school because I wanted a place where I could, where I wanted to teach and where I wanted my kids to go. Wow. And um, this fit that because of the content of what I get to teach and what they get to learn and the discipline. And, I'm, and it just fits. Good. Content and discipline. Can everybody hear? Can you, can you over there hear? Okay, good. Good. Thank you. You're up. I'm Tamika. I am a fifth grader here for two years <laughs> now. Um, yeah. I was sending her to Amman to study because I was not ready to send her to public school system, so I got an opportunity because of the strong academic focus with charter school schools and small school environment. Small school, and then did you say character focus? No, academy. Academy focus. Good. All right, thank you. And let's go back to, to this. Day. Yes, please. Um, my name is Bill Wood. I've got two daughters here, um, second and fourth grade. I was Gary. I was attracted to the curriculum, uh, particularly the core curriculum on like grade six. Big uh, uh, You just told me I said I strongly am philosophy. Did you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they go together. <laughs> they do. Absolutely. Good. Thank you, Bill. Yes. And then over to your right. Hi, my name is Candy, and I have two kids here. I have a fourth grade daughter and a kindergarten boy, and we just moved here about two weeks ago from wow. high school. So we're fairly new, but we have a long list of reasons why we moved. But one of the most important ones, we felt like they were moving so fast through the curriculum and not going back and tying it into other subjects, mm -hmm. and that average was okay, and we don't believe that that is acceptable. Yeah. Okay. If you move really fast, average has to be okay. That's all you can expect. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. And then behind Candy. I'm Terry Zerbis, and I have three children here at the I have two sixth graders, girl boy twins, and I have an eighth grader. Okay, good. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm late. I was late, so I didn't hear what... Oh, what drew you to Eagle Ridge? I'm a parent. Okay. And why did you put your kids here? Um, because of the high expectations mm -hmm. and the uh, rigorous uh, uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. Good. High expectations and rigor. Good. As long as it's not mortis, rigor is good. <laughs> <laughs> You're up. Oh, is that right? I was told that. Okay. So that's why we're here. How long have you had your kids here? Um, since the open or since the lower school opened. Wow, great. Great. Thank you. You're up. I'm Kristen. I have a 11th grader, 7th grader, and 4th grader. And we um, lived overseas for a while. We needed a school. And we came back because we came back almost July. And so we looked into it before we left. And we used some teachers here. And we really enjoy teaching here. And we used the parents. And they spoke highly. Good. Teachers who like teaching, that's always encouraging. <laughs> Good. Thank you. And you're up. I'm Tia, and I have a kindergartner here, and um, we were former homeschoolers with my now 10th grader who came here in 7th. We left, and I wish he'd come back. Um, but yeah, I, I first found out by Carol Joy's side about the importance of lessons. Uh -huh. So that's what I'm Yeah, 
Yes. All right, good. Thank you. And let's go to the back. I'm Lucy. I have three kids here, a 10th grader, a 7th grader, and a 3rd grader. Um, we homeschooled until about three years ago. I really like the Charlotte Mason philosophy mm -hmm. of homeschooling. Um, and this is pretty close. Um, and we were told at one of the opening houses that if your kids don't like to read, they might not like the school. And our kids love to read. So that would be a good fit. And we also like the Latin. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a nerdy culture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Half the people get up and leave. <laughs> All right, good. Well, thanks. You know what? You, you've all been really patient, and what I want to do now is give you a break. Let's take about till that clock says 22, and everybody has to sit in exactly the same seat, otherwise I'll become totally confused. And then we'll pick up again over at this at, at this table here. Okay, is that is that enough time? About eight minutes? Okay, good. Thank you. Oh yeah, the restroom is right across the hallway over there. Yes. I would have said the size of the